morning, everyone here in Australia, New Zealand, this, this side of the hemisphere, and good evening to everybody on the other side of the hemisphere. Uh, so just a quick welcome to Rebecca, and a massive thank you for joining us today to talk about whether we should keep our parrots flighted or whether maybe we should consider clipping them. Um, a very contentious topic, no doubt. So um, thank you for joining us, Rebecca. Thank you. Uh, so what I might get you to do is maybe just give us a little bit of an introduction. Let us know uh, where you come from, what your background is, how you got into parrots and, and parrot behaviour. Yeah, so hi everybody. Uh, I graduated from uh, vet tech school um, in Auto or sorry, in New Brunswick, Canada. Uh, I graduated in about 2013, so I've been a registered veterinary technician for about nine years now. Um, recently, I left um, clinical practice to kind of focus more on behavior. Um, so I did get my um, certified training partner. Uh, status through the Karen Pryor Academy about two years ago. Um, and I really wanted to expand more and work in behavior medicine. Um, so lucky for me, I did find a um, veterinary behavior resident, uh, Dr. Megan Connolly. Uh, and we've been working together for the last couple of months now. Um, and, you know, it's it's really great because I, I learn a lot from her and uh, it's, it's helping my business grow and I can, you know, provide um, a much better much better insight to you know cats dogs and parrots and rabbits so it's it's pretty great that's wonderful and yeah it's it's really great that you've been able to work with somebody with that kind of background and skill to help improve your own knowledge and and obviously you know it's also wonderful to work closely with um, a veterinarian on these kinds of issues because there are lots of lots of considerations when we're talking about behavior and it's not just behavior it's it's all of the other little bits of the, the animal that we need to consider as well including medical and, and health so mm -hmm. that's fantastic cool um, and so Rebecca's business is around the flock companion animal training so uh, that's her website just down there on the ticker at the moment if you want to go and check her out so um, Rebecca, you work obviously um, local to yourself and you do online stuff as well? Yep. So I do virtual and then I serve, I do in-person consults in Ottawa, Canada right now um, and the rest is virtual. So I have been getting uh, more clients um, out of province and of course in the US as well. So it works really great, especially for our pets that are very anxious. I do find yeah. the remote learning uh, is just like a miracle it works so much better <laughs> i still work really hard to convince people to do it but i'm like you know no, you have to understand like this is so like not being right there can be really helpful because your bird behaves more normally um or you know they're not like it depends some birds are so overly friendly that like they kind of attach themselves to me the moment i walk in the door and other birds are nervous and don't want to come anywhere near me and don't behave normally um, and there are so many other benefits to the virtual training. I actually wrote a blog about it because I was like, people need to know why this is so good. <laughs> so, yeah, it's yes. really great. And sometimes too, what I what I notice is if I'm there is I start kind of doing a demonstration of the training and behavior modification. And then the pet doesn't want to work for their person anymore. They'd rather work for me. So there's a bit of a conflict <laughs> there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and, and I guess the thing is that, you know, our job is really just to teach other people how to do it themselves. So mm -hmm. um, that we can do online pretty, pretty easily as well as in person. So don't be shy of virtual training, people. It's very handy. <laughs> and I, I don't know if you do, but I record my sessions and then send it to the client afterwards as well. So they can just keep going back and re-watching things so that they can review what we've talked about as well. So. Yeah, no, that, yeah, that's really great. I, I tend to do um, a report and I go over the exercises that we went over too. So it it's something, another option to kind of go back over and review things. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So um, thank you again for joining us. Um, it's Canada Day in Canada. And so Rebecca is joining us, even though she should probably be out doing fun things with her friends. <laughs> But this is her passion, like me, so um, here we both are instead. Uh, so today's topic is flighted or clipped. Um, we are going to dive a bit into this topic. We're going to talk about, um, you know, 
the considerations for, you know, whether you should be keeping your birds flighted or clipped, uh, go through, you know, areas of recommendation that we can make to, to, you know, help you set your environment up so that you can safely keep, keep flighted birds. Um, you know, we're going to talk about the ethics of clipping and whether it's ever okay or whether it's never okay. <laughs> Uh, so it's going, I, as I said, it can be a bit of a contentious topic. And so I do also just want to really quickly set some ground rules um, where, you know, want and encourage people to leave comments, to ask questions. But if you are commenting, please keep it kind. Uh, it's all about education. If, you know, I, I, I will be monitoring comments as best I can while also chatting and, and having this conversation. Um, but if anybody is rude, then those comments are going to disappear real quickly and you'll probably find yourself not able to keep commenting on the on the page anymore. So um, keep it keep it nice, um, regardless of which side of the fence that you sit on. We don't need to be nasty to anyone. Um, and like I said, it's all about education. Sometimes it's just about when you know better, you do better. And that's what we're here for today. So. Excellent. All right. So as I said, feel free if you need to pop, you, if you've got questions, pop those down in the comments for me and we'll get to them as we go. We've already got one, but I'm just going to leave that. Well, I don't know if it's a, it's more of a comment than a, um, an actual question. So um, I'll leave that there and we can come back to it um, later. But yes, if you've got questions, pop them down in the comments and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible throughout the session as well. All right, excellent. So we'll jump straight in. Um, so Rebecca, um, as somebody that uh, obviously worked as a vet tech for a really long time, um, I guess I wanted to ask you if there were situations that you had that I guess kind of in in a clinical setting that kind of informed your your current opinion on clipping versus flighted birds. You know, were there a lot of um, I guess birds coming in that you saw clipped that was problematic or flighted that was problematic. Yeah, most of the birds that I would see, I guess in practice, it was um, mo most of them I would say were actually flighted, which I was quite lucky for. Um, I did find that the birds at the pet stores, those ones were usually clipped um, quite a bit. Just you know the the whole standard of not flying into the ceiling fans and getting injured and things like that. Um, but yeah, no, normally when I see clipped birds, um, it's usually for um, behavior consulting. This is where I'm seeing that I'm getting a lot of problems. Um, and usually it's it's screaming, um, contact calling, uh, screaming because they want to go somewhere. Um, I even had a case that um, started plucking um, after they got clipped. Just the frustration of not being able to go where he needed to be anymore. He was always stuck. So that's usually where I tend to see um all the problematic clippings yeah yeah cool excellent so yeah i guess that's that you know kind of transitions into what are the main reasons that we see people clipping for and so um in my experience the the, the two primary reasons that we see clipping is the first is um that they're concerned for the bird's safety. So um, they're worried about flying into windows, flying into ceiling fans, um, flying out doorways. Um, I see it a little bit more often with people who have young children because they are concerned obviously about kids opening doors without thought and, and therefore the bird kind of slipping out the door that way. And then the other reason that I, I primarily see clipping is, um, as you said, for behavior reasons. So it's a case of either they, um, they think that maybe clipping is going to help reduce a behavior problem that they're seeing, um, or they want to reduce the bird moving around the house too much. So they want to keep the bird on a play stand or on a, on a perch or on top of their cage and um, clipping kind of facilitates that. So those are the, the main reasons. Very occasionally someone might do it because they want to take their bird outdoors as well. Um, so <laughs> there's, those are the main reasons. And I guess, um, what I thought we could do is we'd, we'd address kind of those primary reasons and maybe what we can change or do or whether we think that that's appropriate under those situations. So I did want to like, you know, maybe we'll touch base on the safety aspect first, so keeping birds safe. Um, and so, Rebecca, do you think that there's ever a, a situation in which clipping a bird for safety purposes is the appropriate action? And if so, what's, you know, what sort of, 
clip in should we be looking at? What's the situation where it's appropriate? What's the, what are the situations where maybe we think it's inappropriate for safety purposes? Yeah, um, I do find when, with safety, we are such an intelligent species. <laughs> we can always find a solution where we don't have to suppress behavior. So I'm a big fan of behavior modification and not behavior suppression. Um, there's so many different things we can do for safety. Um, so something that I can, you know, that I've done personally when it comes to potentially flying out the door um, is I actually had flight risk all on my doors so that people would look at the poster and then check to see where the bird is. So that was like a huge one that I found helped whenever I had guests at the home. Um, that or if, I, if you have guests at the home, just have them in their in their cage for the duration of the time too. So that's an, another option. Um, something else too that um, I found to be very helpful um, is to have like a like an added screen um, to your door that you can just kind of walk through and then it kind of shuts right behind you. So we have so many other options um, that aren't expensive. They don't have to be expensive. It could just be a piece of paper on your window to say like, hey, check for the bird before you go outside. So yeah, I think we, we've gone beyond, <laughs> gone beyond clipping. <laughs> I agree. Um, I, I don't think we at Parrot Life make it any secret that we're generally not advocates of clipping. Um, obviously, later in the day, we'll have a quick chat about maybe some of the situations in which clipping is appropriate, but um, we're pretty big advocates for keeping birds flighted for a number of reasons, and we'll also touch base on why it's beneficial and why there's a lot of fallout. But um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, even so far as like it, realistically, you could build a, um, a, a very small airlock near your front door if you needed to with you know cheap timber and some fly screen so um like i said signs uh i had a client who had flighted birds and and if she was turning the overhead fans on um, or if she was letting the birds out sorry i should say she would put she would put paper signs on top of the fan switches just quickly pop them on so that no one would turn the fans on while the birds were flighted in the house so it is little things like that where you like just have a little sign that says don't open this door um, if you've got kids it's as simple as locking the doors with a key and then putting the key up out of their way so that they physically can't open the doors when we've got loose birds in the house so um and then having that conversation with them about why it's so important to be careful but certainly taking those extra steps of like you know let's just have um, things in place. Um, obviously, people worry about their birds running into windows. Um, so on this topic, I have a whole aviary that's built into a courtyard of my house. So three walls of the aviary are windows that are internal to the house and my bird never runs into those windows. She knows that they're there. We walked around, we tapped on them we you know she 100 is familiar with them and knows that they're there and then again inside my own house there's you know one room that is just primarily windows and we don't have any crashing issues in there so i think a lot of it comes down to um preparing your bird as well so yep yeah especially yeah. The, the clumsy birds that maybe they're not very good flyers as well like we can just you can always teach them to fly better, right? So there's all these these nice little egg targeting exercises that you could do um, to build up that that strength to fly, um, so we can kind of prevent these accidents from happening. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Lots of lots of little safety things that, like like you said, just aren't they're like either free or a very very cost effective way of managing these animals that we choose to bring into our home, knowing that they are a flighted animal, and I think that needs to be a consideration as well. If you don't necessarily feel like you can keep a flighted animal safe in your home then maybe we need to have a rethink about keeping a flighted animal or we rethink how we're keeping them here in australia we obviously have perfect weather and not perfect all of the time it hasn't stopped raining for months <laughs> it's awful <laughs> but we have the sort of weather that allows us to build outdoor aviaries and have our birds in those. So if we want to keep a flighted animal, but we're worried about keeping them safe inside the house, then there's no reason not to build them an aviary and have them living in an aviary, which for a lot of birds is actually a much better option because they're outside, sunlight, fresh air, space to fly, space to be a bird. Um, so certainly I think that's also, you know, sometimes we have to think, you know, 
is what I want, what's best for the animal that I'm going to bring into my home. Mm-hmm. Yeah, awesome. Anything else to add to that one? Uh, for safety? Yeah. No, I think that's something else that I was thinking too, um, especially are we thinking about safety too? Like some, you know, like some of the birds may not really like to have another person in the room and you have like risk of bites and things like that. Um, what first came to mind is actually um, when I, when I saw it on one of your Facebook posts, actually Lee um, for the cat nets, um, oh, yeah. I thought, yeah. I thought that would be such an awesome thing. Cause you can have that indoors. Um, so that yes. way you can t- let the bird out of the cage and have the cat nets um, to kind of have Shut like up. that added, that added protection. So you don't have to worry about them dive bombing anybody in the home. Um, yeah. be, it's it's a good management strategy. I mean, we still want to work on, you know, building a better relationship between, you know, the targeted human, but um, I thought the cat nets would have been a great um, safety precaution there. Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. And we actually um, did recommend those in one, one case where um, a bird was aggressing towards its owner, but under certain circumstances. And, and I think it was like, it wasn't my case, it was one of the other consultants. So I'm remembering um, just the information that she shared with me, but it was like when the TV was on and things like that, the bird got quite over aroused and they would end up flying at her to bite her. And so we were like, well, instead of keeping this bird kind of confined um, in a cage all of the time, when you have, when you're, you know, using your phone or whatever, let's set up this cat net aviary where the bird can still have lots of extra space. It was a relatively small bird, like a condor or something. Um, and so that was a really good management option for that bird. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So excellent. Uh, so on this, we did have a couple of comments where I think maybe um, these kind of fall into this category. So I'll, I'll bring them up. Um, so one of our... Um, Facebook group users has said that she, um, so this is Tanya, she's wanting to reclip hers as she lost a baby because she had him flighted. Um, sorry, Tanya, we can't answer the screaming question in this particular um, live. We would probably recommend doing a consultation to assist with the screaming behaviour. Um, but coming back to the wanting to clip because you've lost a baby, I guess, um, and I'm assuming that this bird got out of the house, um, flighted birds. I also have fly screens on here. Okay, so I don't know the situation in which a bird kind of escaped out of the house. And that's, you know, it is really terrible and unfortunate. Um, and obviously super heartbreaking when birds do manage to get out of the house and we don't retrieve them. Um, I guess some of the considerations there, though, are that being clipped doesn't guarantee not getting out of the house. Um, and I think, personally, this is this is something that I think proper clips negate the safety aspect. Um, and so what I mean by that is that if we're clipping a bird in a way that's appropriate, so that is that the bird can still glide, um, then they can still get out a door if we leave a door open or if we accidentally walk with them on our shoulder. I don't, like I said, I don't know the situation in which a bird slipped outside, but regardless, um, when people become complacent when their birds are clipped as well because they don't think that they can get away. But then what we have is we have a bird who's outside, um, they're clipped, maybe they got a bit of height and got quite a distance away because there was wind underneath them and um, a bird with a, you know, a nice soft clip that isn't going to leave them crashing down to the ground can still glide. Um, and so you're still in that same situation, except now your bird's outdoors and clipped and they can't get away from that dog or that cat or that car that's coming at them. Um, and they can't, they don't have the skills to fly down properly. So I don't think necessarily that... Um, having a bird escape is a good reason to go ahead and clip other birds, but rather we need to look at the situation and go, okay, how can we make sure that this ne- never happens again, that this situation in which my bird got outside never happens again um, and, and put in place things for that. So, so Tanya has said that her daughter forgot he was out and held the door open um, and he's been missing since April. Uh, so, you know, that's one of those situations, like we said, where we talk about 
you know, maybe we have the doors locked when the birds are loose in the house or we have in place, you know, if you need to go out of the house, you go via the laundry. So you go into the laundry, shut the internal door, use the external door to go out. Or we go into the garage, we shut the garage door, then we open the next garage door and we go outside. So we have in place, we just don't open external doors when the birds are loose in the house unless there's another door between us. Um, so there are certainly, and I don't know how old your daughter is and whether she's old enough, I guess, obviously, to understand just not opening external doors or if it's a case of we just need to lock those doors when the birds are loose in the house. But as I said, I don't think it's necessarily a... Um, you know, a reason to, to go ahead and clip the next birds. Um, Rebecca, anything to add to that? Yeah, and and definitely, like, it is definitely really hard to lose a bird. And I can only, ima I can only imagine the stress that I would go through if that, if that ever happened. But we also have to look at, um, you know, benefit versus risk. Um, I think we really need to kind of get that ratio where the risk of losing a bird is is relatively small compared to the benefits of having them flighted. So many of our birds um, suffer from heart disease, you know, like they're not getting as much exercise as they would, you know, in their natural state. So um, I think like even um, just teaching some recall and things like that, um, which, you know, I, I'm sure I'm sure Lee and myself could happily teach you that um, would help um, prevent kind of these these escapes or even a stationing behavior, you know, things like that. So if you're if you're going somewhere, you can ask your bird to station um, and then you can leave through the door. Um, definitely reevaluate what happened um, last time and try to make modifications on that. Um, so, yeah. So like even having the screen or I'm not sure if you guys have these in um, Australia, but in the winter time here, we have like a you can add like an extra shelter in front of the door. So it kind of like blocks in um the cold from coming into the home. So that's something you could probably add to the front door too, is that extra door you need to go through. And it's just like plastic, like it's nothing fancy. It's it's not expensive. We don't have those as far as I'm aware. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it well, doesn't snow a lot here, but I mean, it does in some places, but. <laughs> They're that's great. Cool. Yeah, maybe there's something we could we could do. Ship it over. We'll send you some. <laughs> I'm sure you could get them made. Um, yeah. Well, like I said, it's as simple as you know, building using some you know cheap pine timber to build a frame, and and using some screen like just fly screen on the frame which is again not super expensive and building that in front of your front door or on the inside of your front door depending on your space requirements um or like you know I, I you know like you said there's yeah a couple of things that we can do there so um Cheryl just made a comment to say that she locks her doors and hangs the keys on the handle and that that's to remind herself that the birds are out and then she said you could also use a sign that hangs on the handle exactly yeah it's like like you're in a little hotel and you can like turn the sign over birds loose birds birds locked up <laughs> so, that's a good idea like said, you know we are really smart um you know humans we're smart animals and we can certainly come up with lots of solutions to make this um as you know as safe as possible so and like you said it's also that risk versus benefits um weighing up and we'll talk about the benefits of obviously flighted birds um today as well Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it sounds like it was um, just a combination of unfortunate circumstances mm -hmm. that led to that. And, and I guess that's it exactly. The risks are pretty low because the the likelihood of those things lining up again is pretty low. Um, and again, realistically, even a clipped bird could have gotten out that door. But then we've got a bird outdoors that just has absolutely no flight skills and, and no muscle tone and no way to get off the ground if they end up on the ground. And they can end up much further away than you expect them to. So awesome. Any cool? Any other questions on on the safety side of things? If you've got them, pop them down there now. Uh, but otherwise, what we might do is move into the behaviour area. So the um, you know, is, you know, is there ever a time, is there ever an appropriate reason for, you know, from the behavioural side of things when we're working with, you know, birds maybe who are displaying some serious aggression issues where we might consider clipping as an option? Um, and then, you know, I guess what are, again, the benefits versus the risks of that set up as well? Um, Rebecca, did you want to? 
Yeah. Well, I guess we were kind of touching base about that, about that earlier. So yeah, again, yeah. like if it, if it's like a, you know, aggression towards another person, there's definitely other options, whether it's the bird only comes out um, in its aviary, maybe you'll have a special room for your bird that you can hang out in. Um, so they don't interact with this, the human that kind of stresses them out. Um, we can always add the cat nets. That's always like a great option. Um, any any type of netting, really, especially depending on how your house is built, too. You can you can kind of put them on um, the entryways so that your bird has a nice big space uh, and doesn't have to interact with with the person. Um, again, these are just management. We still kind of want to work on um, counter conditioning the the bird's response to to the person. Um, and I think too, like. Even when we have, like, if we're worried about, um, like, cats and dogs in the home um, and the birds are clipped, that also kind of re removes their opportunity to escape if ever there's an altercation. Not that I ever recommend kind of keeping them together, but, yeah, there's things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. That's some, yeah, something I need to think of under the safety one is that sometimes people mm -hmm. um, might clip because they think it helps to keep things safer but obviously having a flighted bird around predators is a much safer option because mm -hmm. they can get away but like you said generally re don't recommend allowing predators and prey species yeah. to interact because aside from, you know even if you think that your dog or cat is perfectly safe which fyi no <laughs> i cannot tell you i've even been involved in situations where dogs have killed other little dogs that they've lived with for a long time under predatory circumstances so i can promise you that your dog and cat aren't perfectly safe with your bird regardless of how well they've gotten along but let's say that they are your bird is now desensitized to cats and dogs and if they do get outside where they're less likely to fly away from that very unfriendly dog that's now approaching them because they've landed in that dog's yard or something along those lines. So there are other reasons to also keep your bird from, you know, spending too much time with dogs and cats, but that's a, probably a different topic altogether. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so from a, from a um, behaviour modification perspective, I guess there's, again, you have to weigh up the, the risks versus the benefits. Um, from a risks perspective, the risks of clipping are that, you know, you end up with a bird who develops other behaviour problems. So, you know, I see people that might clip their bird because they, f the bird flies around the house and lands on them all day and they don't want the bird to be on them all day. They'd rather the bird stay on their play stands or their cages um, or, you know, they've got a um, an issue where the bird sometimes flies and tries to attack somebody in the house. Um, and what happens is they clip and then they end up developing a different problem. So then we've got a bird who is instead sitting on their cage and screaming all day because they don't have anything better to do. Um, and sitting on top of your cage all day is super boring when you're a highly intelligent social species. Um, and so they develop screaming because they're looking for some way to get to get away from that situation, you know, looking for attention or looking for somebody to come and get them and move them around because they can't do it themselves. So we really take away um, their autonomy when we do that. And when we remove control over their own kind of autonomy and their and their choices, and we we increase other behaviour problems. And like Rebecca said, she's also seen situations where that's turned into further destructive behaviour as well. Um, so the risks of clipping to try and modify behaviour are that we end up with other problem behaviours popping up more often than not. Um, and, you know, I find it's very much a Band-Aid solution once the bird starts, you know, either comes up with a different way to, to kind of achieve the same results or they start to regrow their feathers back, the behaviour resumes immediately. So really what we're doing is, is shutting the bird down, essentially. Any thoughts on that, Rebecca? Yeah, I'm just trying to think. I think the shutdown is quite important because I did have some cases where um, the veterinarian was recommending clipping um, due to aggression. Um, so when the bird was fully flighted, he was more likely to bite. But then when he got clipped, this is when the biting stopped and he was more willing to step up and, and all that stuff. Um, but the issue is it's not 
the bird hasn't really changed his perception of you know why he's trying to attack if anything it just shuts down his he's just in shut down so it's like a state of learned helplessness where they understand that no matter what they do um, they're not going to be able to escape the situation or control the situation so they just stop behaving they stop expressing behavior so i see yeah. i do see that with clip birds they just kind of give up yeah I've, I've seen that also um that's really sad and i guess um there's this misconception that those birds are just more relaxed because they're not doing anything but actually what we're seeing is is like this yeah state of shutdown this learned helplessness um that's developed because like i said they've just kind of lost all control over their own environment and their own outcomes and and it can lead to some like essentially you know a depression type state for our parrots so yep. Yep. Um, and that's not why we have parrots in our homes we don't want depressed animals so <laughs> um, it certainly needs to be like a really big consideration um, I also feel like it drives I guess some codependency as well because of the become so reliant on the humans to do anything to get anywhere to get anything done um, and that kind of dysfunctional relationship also drives a lot of problem behavior in my experience as well so yep. I see a lot of I see a lot of dysfunctional human parrot relationships um flighted and clipped and it's it's a really big driving um driver behind problem behaviors that i see screaming for the destructive behavior biting um yeah so yep. we don't want dysfunctional relationships we want independent birds who who can um, do their own thing and get around and, and make their own choices so and it just means that we have to put the work into the training with them um, and also to have in place things that you know we can utilize to manage the environment and the situation as well mm -hmm. so then i guess you know i would ask is there a situation where you might think that clipping is um appropriate for behavior so i guess you know i'm talking about we've got a bird who is um you know let's say has one owner um so one person taking care of this bird and the bird is flying and, and biting this per this person in the face um and i guess you know the options are we rehome you know which might might help resolve the issue but it might not um, we might just end up passing obviously this problem onto a different situation or you know obviously the potential for euthanasia you know, other situations like that where you're like, well, maybe clipping is going to be an intermediary for this, or is you know, have you have you never felt like that's a that's a situation? Personally, no. Um, just because of all like the management strategies that we kind of went over uh, previously, and and something too that you know, since you, you kind of did mention about rehoming, and I think it's very important for people to understand that you are not failing if you have to rehome your bird. Um, I find like this, there's such a huge stigma in regards to rehoming your pet, whether, whether it's a dog with a behavior disorder or a parrot or a cat. Um, but honestly, if, if your mental health matters, the pet's mental health matters, if it's just not compatible, they're going to be much happier in somebody else's home. So I just want to make sure that like, if ever it comes to the point where you feel you need to rehome, like you're not a failure, it's, it's, pro it's for the best, right? Like, you got to look at, at both sides. It's never black and white. So I think that's and, yeah. important. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, there's there are times where rehoming is a totally appropriate response yep. to a situation. Um, and and like you said, the human's mental health and quality quality of life is important as much as the quality of life of the animal in question. Sorry, my birds are losing their, their minds apparently. <laughs> um, and. And realistically, if our mental health and quality of life is decreased, the likelihood is that we can't provide for that animal as best we can anyways either. Um, and so there are certainly situations where um, rehoming is, is often the kindest option for everybody. And that bird is probably going to be able to go on and live a better life in a different situation. Um, and again, I guess, you know, coming back to the example of the bird um, that I just spoke about where, you know, maybe 
um, the person has, you know, done all of the behaviour modification, used all of the management and is still, you know, in significant danger from their own animal. Um, you know, I think that there's also sometimes cases where it's like, well, this bird is actually going to be much better off in an aviary type environment where it still gets human interaction, but it can be out outdoors, be a bird, and, you know, we can more easily manage their behaviour. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm just going to close my door. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I have opinions about something. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, rehoming is another another contentious topic. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, certainly on the same page as you there. That um, obviously we don't want to get animals and just you know willy nilly rehome them. But if you've truly you know put in everything that you can and you've worked with professionals and you or the bird or both of you are not living to, you know, your best lives and there's no shame in doing Mm -hmm. that. Nope, not at all. Yeah, excellent. All right, well, um, do you want to, so we we obviously um, spoke a little bit about earlier before we got on that there are some situations where clipping might be um, appropriate. Um, from a vet tech perspective, someone that's worked in clinical settings, what's what kind of situations would you consider appropriate for clipping? Yeah, I would say more um, injuries. So let's say that your bird uh, injured its wing, it broke a bunch of primary feathers, it's a bit lopsided, you know, having like an ethical trim just to kind of balance things out until the feathers regrow. Um that would to me would be acceptable because there is the risk of really hurting themselves um, just from that that off balance whether they're falling um, and I was telling Lee like my my poor little cockatiel he broke his wing so he's all lopsided and he falls right so it's kind of to try to make that fall a little less you know of a thud and more of a, a, a swoosh <laughs> a swoosh down to <laughs> <him>. <laughs> yeah so yeah. that would be that would be probably a, a situation where it would be ethical to do. Yeah, yeah. So where the bird is essentially at, at risk of injuries if they, you know, if we don't kind of clip that yeah. that other wing or, you know, kind of modify their flight a little bit to ensure that they're, you know, they're gliding rather than circle crashing or, you know, <laughs> yeah. just engaging in really uncontrolled flight opportunities. Yeah, yep. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so medical some medical situations so um and I mean that brings me into um let's talk about appropriate clips because unfortunately in my experience and I don't know if this is something that you see a lot over there as well um unfortunately I see a lot of inappropriate clips um and so that can be a one wing clip where we actually create the situation that we just talked about trying to avoid (laughs) where someone has come and just clipped all of the flight feathers from one wing on a bird. I tend to find that this is done primarily with smaller birds because obviously they are so light that they can often fly even with, with, you know, some clipping done. So, um, or I see clips where the bird is um, had all of their primary feathers trimmed back and trimmed back really high. And some in some cases, I see birds that have been clipped both primary and secondary feathers um, all of the way back. Um, and so obviously, these aren't appropriate clips. These are very inappropriate clips. Um, and there are reasons for that. But um, Rebecca, yeah. what would you recommend regarding clipping um, yeah. and, and talking to talking to your vet about clipping, you know, having that conversation? What sort of yeah. things should people be asking for? Yeah, so I, it's kind of, you, you mentioned that. I actually um, had a client last week who she got a bird where they actually clipped all the, the, the wing feathers, like the primary, secondaries, and they actually chopped off the tail feathers too. So that, yeah, that was, that was bad. (laughs) That was a really botched. Yeah. So you can, you can, you really don't know, like people, not everybody's educated. Not all vets are educated um, in regards to clipping. A lot of vets aren't even educated in behavior. That is still a really big struggle and it's no fault of their own. It's just, they're, they're really not taught that in school. It is getting better. Um, Granted, they do have more um, behavior stuff in vet school now and in tech school, but it's, it's still a learning curve. Um, um, so yeah, I do find like the most vets are still on 
board with clipping. I know at the Exotics Con last year, they were going over appropriate clips and, and things like that. And then they were kind of discussing the pros and cons of each, but they never really addressed like the behavior aspect uh, and the downfall that comes uh, with clipping, but they did kind of give some guides on the best way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, I guess from in my experience, <clears throat> most avian vets generally do good clips in that you know they are generally safe and appropriate for the species of bird and that because not every clip is appropriate for every species um where i see the biggest problems is with non-avian vets doing clips um unfortunately and a lot will actually say no we don't do birds <laughs> but then there's that one vet who's like yeah no worries i can clip your bird and unfortunately then what i see is like these really really heavy clips um all one-sided clips what i would recommend is absolutely never ever 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 letting anyone that isn't a vet clip your birds no groomers no trainers which i've seen as well i went out to a client who had already had somebody out to help her with the bird and that person had basically walked in and clipped one wing for that bird um so please don't let trainers groomers pet stores clip your birds wings um because unfortunately this is where we see <clears throat> the biggest this is where i personally see the biggest issues with clips is that they're yep. mostly inappropriate in those situations um and there is you know aside from the potential mental emotional fallout of clipping there are also physical issues that can occur if a, a bird is clipped inappropriately so um something that most people probably don't realize is that when birds are molting their primary feathers the rest of the feathers provide support for that new feather as it comes in as a blood feather um, so they're there and it's less likely to get knocked and broken um, when you clip the sort of clips that we're talking about especially these really really inappropriate ones where all of the primaries are gone um, even just the primaries when those new blood feathers do start to come through we commonly see birds that are falling because they have no gliding and no flight they fall they knock the blood feather it breaks that causes pain obviously there's a lot of bleeding but it causes pain and that can then lead to other issues popping up but i mean one you, you end up with this bird who can't even grow their feathers back at all because they keep getting broken constantly um but then that can also spiral into um other issues related to like um to, to pain and things like that so i'm gonna show a photo and if you are on our facebook page you may or may not have sh seen some of these photos previously um sorry my computers uh so this is like if you um are likely to get distressed by a photo of you know a, a wound on a bird's wing i would just recommend turning away now and i'll let you know when it's safe to come back so um just you know possibly distressing con content uh, so this is the sort of thing that we can sometimes see occur when a bird so this is a relatively extreme case but this is the sort of thing that we see occur when birds um have a a too heavy a clip so this bird was clipped by the pet store that he was purchased from um and he was clipped back so far that um, the, the feathers just couldn't grow back. Every time he'd get a blood feather, it would get broken, getting knocked on the cage. Um, he started to develop a, like a neuroses, essentially. He started to develop strong fear responses to humans approaching because, they, you know, he might knock his wing. And so when humans would approach, he would panic, knock his wings more. He started engaging in like this kind of self-mutilation of his wing here that you see. Um, and it just, it really spiraled. Um, and even with medications, pain medications and behavior med medications and um, really perfectly set up cage environments with lots of padding and towels and ways to try and prevent them from getting knocked, um, he, this bird was not able to overcome this issue. And in the end, he had to be euthanized because his quality of life just wasn't there. So um, this is, like I said, it's a relatively extreme case but it's not the first time. Um, uh, so that photo is gone now if, it, if people were um, trying to look away. It's not the first time I've come up upon it, unfortunately. I had another case um, 
probably 12 or so months ago in which uh, a bird was in a similar type of situation where fear was developing around people and hands um, because of the bad clip that led to lots of falls and knocks and the bird was self-mutilating their wings. And unfortunately in that case, even with vet care, the bird developed sepsis and passed away. So um, it's not just the behavioural side of things that may lead to the bird no longer being able to um, live a good quality of life, but the bird may also end up sick from these injuries um, and pass away as well. So like I said, these are relatively extreme cases, but they are far from the only time, you know, the only time we see them, um, unfortunately. So, um, and like I said, it's still a case of, it's pretty distressing for your bird, even if all they're doing is breaking blood feathers, but not progressing to that next stage as well. Yeah. Yeah, and and something to consider too is fear is just as real as pain. Um, yeah. So hand in hand, like they both need to be addressed. Um, it's just it's you know fear fear is like a different version of physical pain. It's emotional pain. So yeah, it's not a way to live. Mm -mm. So um, like I said, it's it's pretty extreme, um, but we see these sorts of things on a, on a semi-regular basis. And I think it's important for people to see and to understand the potential consequences. Um, and, and like I said, that's a, that's a physical consequences, but there are also plenty of mental and emotional fallout and consequences um, and physical health consequences as well. Um, so obviously, you know, with, with poor clips, we also see birds that um, crash full, crack open their keel or break the end of their beak or, um, you know, like I know that, um, you know, sometimes they'll fall on their tail and they'll end up with long-term tail injuries that can also lead to self-mutilation. Um, so there's all of those physical issues, the, like, you know, where they crash and hurt themselves. But um, we also see, I guess, um, health issues as well. Um, Rebecca, have you seen much in the way of you know, heart, health issues? Heart, heart disease. Heart disease is so prevalent uh, in our in our captive birds, and you know it, it goes across like either they're even even some flighted birds, um, well many flighted birds and clipped birds equally. They they do suffer a lot from heart disease. So I think it's really important to have our birds engage in flight um, and fly lots. And I know like we'll, we'll never be able to replicate what they get in the wild, but um, we, we can definitely try. And also obesity too, you have to look at arthritis. Um, these are all issues where lack of mobility can really exasperate these, these diseases. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously diet plays a big part in that as well. Mm -hmm. But if, you know, even if you're, you know, birds on a great diet, if you're just sitting on a perch, for 24 hours of the day, they're going to develop health issues. So, you know, moving, using your muscles and your respiratory system is super important to your, your overall physical and mental health as well. So, um, and, you know, I think we've probably touched base on the emotional and mental fallout issues um, previously, you know, things like codependency and uh, a lack of agency and um, ability to, you know, make your own choices and control your own outcomes, which lead to a lot of other behaviour problems developing in the long run as well. So, um, you know, and I think realistically, we just also can't begin to fully understand the potential consequences because we're not flighted animals. And yeah. so we can't understand what it's like to be flighted and then not to be flighted. Um, and even for animals who maybe um, and I guess that, that brings me on to another one. It's like, oh, maybe we should clip them before they learn to fly. And that's its own, you know, little rabbit hole of issues as well, because then we have, you know, and their brains, not just their bodies, but their brains are evolved for flight. Um, and so not flying has consequences neurologic, neurologically for them as well. Yep. You know, all of these things are interconnected and it's so, you know, so um, complex that, you know, where we can, we should be keeping them flighted and encouraging flight as much as possible for their mental, physical, everything, well-being. Benefit versus yeah. risk. There's so much yeah. more benefit than there is risk for this. So Yeah, <laughs> yeah I agree so much. Um, cool. Is there anything else that you wanted to like kind of dive into touch base on cover off with regards to clipping yeah i think we got like got a lot of it yeah so is that, there are a couple of comments here as well which i'll maybe we'll just um go over to 
Uh, so this comment from Bianca, Bianca is from Perth, but she's on holiday in Seattle at the moment. <laughs> so her baby Latino Alexandrine Brule, or Brule is temporarily clipped until she learns to come to me as close to 100% of the time as possible because as a blind person, I want to make sure she's in a place where I can monitor. She will be flighted and will get suit trained to the leash when I come back from my trip. I cried about clipping her, but I needed to know where she was so she wouldn't use her speed to get away. Um, so that's a, I guess, a different kind of situation to what we've discussed because we're, you know, here we're talking about somebody who um, is non-sighted themselves and so therefore um, obviously we need to consider um, a different different level of safety. Yeah, that's, very, it, that's actually quite interesting. Yeah, it's a very interesting perspective for sure. Yeah, yeah, obviously very hard for us to speak to that kind of situation um, ourselves because we're not, we're obviously not been in that situation. So mm -hmm. um, I can definitely see little Alexandrians being quite fast and um, yeah, yeah, I honestly, I can imagine that um, keeping parrots and, and being not sighted must be super challenging, um, but, you know, I, I do love that you want her to be flighted, I guess. And so that's, you know, that your end goal is to keep her safe while you get her to a point where she can stay flighted. So um, yeah. I'm not sure that, you know, I, I, I can have an opinion on that. <laughs> so, but, you know, I do appreciate you sharing that experience and the, and the reasons why you've kind of made that choice in this situation. And I'm assuming, Bianca, that you um, ensured that you chose a, good avian vet to do that clip and it's a nice soft clip and, and that she's able to glide and not crash and things like that. Awesome. Um, what else? Uh, so Angela has said her daughter's breeder wants to clip her bird's wings and they are the collectors when we pick it up, she says to help with bonding. My daughter wants to harness train a bird. Breeder says just once. My daughter isn't convinced it's necessary. She wants it as a companion assistance bird to go outside out and about with her. Yeah, um, red flag. If the, if the breeder won't agree to leave the bird unclipped, then I would find a new breeder personally. That would be my, you know, in the end, the bird is your bird um, and it should be 100% up to you as to whether you choose to clip that bird or not. Um, and if they want to force that onto you, then um, as I said, in my my opinion, I would be finding a different breeder um, yeah, because it's not necessary. And the bonding thing is just a load of, well, you know, I won't say it, rude word. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. You, you'll still be able to have a nice bond with your bird, even flighted. That does, that doesn't, yeah. if anything, you know, like I said, like learned helplessness, right? Like they have nothing, they're solely reliant on you, like the whole time, right? When they're clipped. So, yeah, they need, they that's need... more likely to drive that codependent, dysfunctional mm -hmm. relationship that we've already talked about yeah. and the problems yeah. that come with that as well. And yeah, there's just, I, you know, none of my birds have been clipped uh actually sorry that was a lie my female if you did come to me clipped under a similar circumstance I wasn't actually aware she would be when she came to me it was a pretty soft clip um I wouldn't wouldn't have allowed it now if I was in that same situation again um yep. but um you know my other birds have all come to me fully flighted and I have not had any issues Yep. bonding with them it's it's not a it's a very old school kind of old wives tales sort of situation to say that you need to clip a bird to bond with them it's just it's just not true you'll really appreciate having a bird that can play independently trust me <laughs> so absolutely yeah yeah exactly that's it's that's it's, good. it's nice and cute at first and they're always like in your face and want to be with you but it gets old trust me it gets old and and when it they need your attention really yeah and when they yeah. need your attention all the time you're like oh my god i just want to watch tv or i just want to you know leave the house um and you can't so yeah definitely you know nurture that independence it's so important yeah and that's it it's it like you know have a healthy like you know again the whole bonding thing it's it's more about codependency it's not that you will have a better bond with your bird because also you know that's anyways <laughs> but that essentially what they're relying on is creating a codependent bird which it becomes problematic when that bird does become flighted later down the track because now they won't leave you alone <laughs> because they've not learned to leave you alone yep. um and then you get screaming, the screaming, the screaming, the screaming. Oh, so, yeah. And baby Eckies are like <laughs> screamers, anyways. Baby Eckies. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many inquiries I get about my seven month old Eckie keeps making this terrible screaming sound. I'm like, yep. <laughs> 
Oh dear. Um, so yeah, as I said, please either, you know, really put your foot down on that. And if they won't agree to it, then I would strongly recommend that you just find a different breeder. Um, and Angela, I know Angela, her and her daughter are coming to some of my workshops at the moment. Um, I'm more than happy to make recommendations for good breeders if that's what you need as well. So let me know. <laughs> um, awesome. What else? Um, someone had basically said, um, also oh, one of the Tanya who we were talking to earlier, she said on the clipping side, my galah was clipped two years ago by the breeder. His feathers grew back bar the two middle ones in wing. Is that how they grow back? Or do you think the breeder cut too short? Um, sometimes they can take a while to, to re like to molt out and regrow all of their feathers, especially, um, captive parrots because they're often living indoors and not getting natural sunlight and things like that and I find that it can actually take two or three years for them to go through a full molt and to get back so I wouldn't necessarily say that those ones aren't going to um, molt out and grow back at this stage um, because generally you can't clip back too far the the time that you would see follicle damage is if the, the wing feather has been pulled out like physically actually been pulled out of the follicle um clipping itself shouldn't damage the follicle so not sure but it may still just be a slow growth so um and then bianca did come back and say um, she has amazing avian vet. Also, the biggest challenge with keeping parrots with outside is not being able to read body language. But on the other hand, it teaches them to be vocal and find ways to communicate without visuals. She can be strange with people looking at her because it's not usual for her. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's something I wouldn't have thought of. Like, yeah, your birds might all be a bit, like, um, I guess, put off if people stare at them. So. <laughs> So I guess something to think about socialising them too when they're young so that they are used to that sort of thing if you're, um, you know, if you're having them obviously and you want to take them out and about with you on a harness, it's probably a good idea to socialise them to people staring at them or looking at them because you get a lot of attention when you go out with a bird on a harness, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, so. Too much, too much attention. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you just want to um, go for a walk, you know. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> if, if, I take, if I take my green wing macaw to the markets... Um, and I just want to get a coffee. It's going to take me an hour to get from the gate to where the coffee is. <laughs> <laughs> Every time. <laughs> um, and then Cheryl asked, could that create separation anxiety? I'm assuming that's in relation to the like clipping the young birds before they go to their new homes for bonding. And yes, absolutely, because your, your bird becomes so codependent on you to get around and to do things um, that it can create that codependency can lead to, yeah, separation distress or separation anxiety in the bird. Um, on that topic, actually, I guess that's the, that's the thing that, like for me, if you're going, if you have a bird that can't fly for some reason, then we should make, be making our homes as accessible as possible for them. So that is, you know, we have ropes from um, their cage to play stands to other play stands. Um, they have ways to climb down to get <clears throat> onto the floor if it's safe for them to do so, obviously, to, you know, with, within reason. Um, and so, you know, we should be making our homes accessible if we have birds that can't fly so that they can get they have that same like you know at least some autonomy and agency within their life because it's so important to them and that kind of makes clipping them redundant for some people <laughs> you know if you're clipping your bird because you want it to stay on its cage or on its play stand then that's you know realistically what we should be doing is then making it that our home is accessible as possible for them so it makes it redundant you may as well keep them flighted and instead use your powers of cognition to teach them to hang out on their play stand and to train them because we have that ability they are very trainable um they are incredibly intelligent and we can absolutely teach them to hang out on play stands and stations and and to not you know fly around the house after us all of the time and that's where people like rebecca and i come in because we can help you with that <laughs> awesome. big fan of carbo nuts Oh, yes, actually, I was just looking at the one I bought like two weeks ago for my green room and she's already chewed through one of the corners. I'm like, oh, oh this is so expensive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the things we do for them. Yep. Um, awesome. So uh, I think that's all of the comments and questions we've had. 
Um, so any final closing thoughts, Rebecca, any final things you wanted to say? There's always an, an alternative option. Sorry. <laughs> it's getting late. It's like, I need to now. Yes, there's always an alternative option um, to clipping, especially if we're trying to solve a behavior problem or, um, you know, the myths of, you know, making them more dependent on us, which we don't really want. We really want independence. Um, you will you can always have a good bond with your bird, regardless if they're clipped or not. And and them starting to behave better after a clip um, is usually a sign of learned helplessness. Like, I, I, I can't imagine that a bird that was attacking now is not attacking. And, you know, being cooperative with you, uh, it's just, it's, it's a state of learned helplessness. So something to keep in the back of your mind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's that, it's that, you know, keeping, you know, keeping, yeah, it's, you know, comparisons can be drawn to, you know, situations where people are, um, you know, being held captive in some way, shape or form, whether it's emotionally or physically, um, you know, you can go into learned helplessness and that's what, you know, you don't suddenly go from biting someone to not biting someone because you're clipped. It's just, there's something else going on underneath all of that so um yeah so hopefully we've cleared up some of the misconceptions around clipping and why it might be appropriate hopefully uh, we've given you some ideas on ways to set up your environment for success and safety for your birds so that you don't feel the need to clip them um, and again i just uh really 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 want to stress the importance of reaching out for assistance either from ourselves or from Rebecca. Um, if you are in a situation where you're like, well, I don't, I don't understand how I can overcome this without clipping my bird. Um, we're, you know, we're professionals. This is our area of expertise. We want to help you. Um, and so, you know, reach out because there is, like Rebecca said, there's always alternative options in these sort of situations. And um, that's what we're here for. And we're, we're more than happy to help you out judgment free. Um, to, to help get on top of these issues even if your bird is already clipped but you want to you want to address the issue that's that's popped yep. up um, before they start flying again um, reach out because you know that's that's what we'll do that's what we're here for so don't um, don't feel like you can't awesome um, excellent that's it Thank you great. so much for joining us, Rebecca. Um, you. You know, super appreciative of you taking some time out of your day to come and um, chat about this topic. And I'm sure that you know we'll probably get you back on at another stage to talk about it or something else. So yeah, it's <laughs> fun. I feel like we've, we've probably touched really, really with like you know gently on a few other topics that are um, probably worth talking about in more detail as well. So I'm sure we can come back at a later stage and have another chat about those things too. Yeah, no, this is this is great. For our first time really? doing a live, I'm like, I'm not sure how this is gonna go out. <laughs> That's what okay. everybody said. That's yeah. it's awesome because I think I've I've helped a few people do their first ever live now. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. But it's good. It's good. I liked it. It was fun. Yeah, awesome. All right. Well, uh, thanks everybody who joined along at home and sent in questions and comments. We really appreciate it. And we also really appreciate uh, that everybody, you know, kept it nice and civil and um, were willing to open up in, um, about their own struggles with their birds and, you know, really brave sharing from some of our, um, from some of our attendees today as well, because it can be hard sometimes to open up about our own situations. So thank you very much for opening up. Um, and I hope that, you know, we, able, we gave you some ideas to move forward with your own birds. That's it for today. Uh, everybody have a wonderful Canada night if you're over in Canada. And for everybody over here, have a fantastic weekend. And we'll be back at some stage in the future with another live. Thanks, everyone. Bye.